and welcome thank you and welcome to at another edition of uh, inside new series this is a special one uh, and a special speaker uh, as, uh, i like to uh, thank and also welcome anu gupta uh, all the way from singapore she's logged in uh, it's a, it's a weekend for her but she set aside time so thank you so much anu for doing this on behalf of the uh, president the secretary and all the executive committee of the advertising club madras i like to extend a warm welcome and a warm welcome to people who are logged in from different places their offices homes and wherever you are uh, please sit back and relax it's going to be an exciting session and i'm sure you're not going to be you know uh, thinking why did i waste my time or anything like that after logging in because anu is a great speaker and i'm sure she's got a lot of interesting anecdotes and experience because she's worked in different uh, you know countries especially the middle east india southeast asia where she's residing currently in singapore and i'm sure uh, the fact that uh, she has been exposed to such a huge amount of uh, you know different cultures and she is going to be telling us about how cultures can really play a great part in shaping communications especially when this world has become a global marketplace so thank you and uh, i would like to now uh, request suraj to uh, just introduce anu yes thank you thank you for that anu uh, i think that introduction sets the stage really well uh, a warm welcome to everyone i see a lot of uh, our regular uh, you know folks who have always been part of our past 20 sessions be you know in this session as well a lot of our uh, gac trichy students thank you for making it Uh, this evening uh, so anu that's though they might seem like one or two uh, you know uh, logins there are about 50 60 students sitting out of a classroom in trichy watching this so uh, it may the numbers may not seem exactly what it is right <laughs> okay so let me uh, dive into introducing anu already anu started her career in public relations over 25 years ago in india before moving to dubai in 2003 and singapore in 2009 bringing a wealth of hands on regional experience to the company no stranger to the startup world anu founded watermelon pr in 2003 growing it into one of the strongest local independent public communication agencies in dubai her foray into singapore's burgeoning startup ecosystem began in 2015 where she worked closely as a pr advisor to budding startups and venture capital firms She joined APRW in 2017, one of Singapore's largest and oldest locally owned integrated communication agencies as an owner director to set up a practice that would work with then with the then emerging startup sector across industries like e-commerce, fintech, food and beverage, SaaS, travel and hospitality and many more. Many of which are regional industry leaders today. She also leads the agency's operations in Indonesia. and focuses on cross border work across both offices in 2019 she spearheaded the agency's decision to set up its first overseas office in indonesia with the support of enterprise singapore and currently oversees the agency's global network initiatives via iprex anu spends ample time mentoring founders and early stage startups on the importance of brand building and public relations She serves as a council member of Singapore Chamber of Commerce Indonesia SCCI and is a global board member of IPREX. Thank you so much for taking the time out Anu and over to you. Thank you. I think I probably forgot to mention that I love to keep watching Netflix and and that's probably my favorite you know job in the world. and 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 being around both my girls who are 17 and 12 years but but again a big thanks to all of you uh, it's a friday evening it's just not a weekend for me it's a weekend for all of you uh, so i hope that you know you don't treat this as something being very serious uh, you know and look at this as something to be more i would say fun and exciting as a topic uh and hopefully you know at any point you do feel that there's something that you want to learn more out of this uh always feel free to connect with me through linkedin uh that would be the fastest way um i i've put very few slides together uh but i know that there are a lot of students here 
And a large part of my journey, you know, really started when I passed out of university when I was 21 years old. So I'm going to definitely kickstart, uh, you know, a little bit with that story, because I think that uh, had a very, very crucial role to play when I think back today, uh, you know, and where it's got me in my in my career, in my life. Um, so I'm assuming people can see this, uh, you know, uh, the slides here. I've put a couple of flags here. Uh, of course, these are countries where I have lived, uh, where I have grown up, where I have worked, uh, starting with India, which is where I was born. Uh, and I grew up uh, originally from Kerala, but spent most of my childhood in Delhi and graduated out of Delhi. And when I turned 21, uh, a very interesting opportunity came my way, which is way back in 1997 which was to go on an international exchange program into Germany, which is why there's a German flag there. And, you know, in 1997, now when I reflect back, there were no mobile phones. We were on fax machines. I don't even know how my parents sent me for that one year program. Uh, you know, and I could call home only like once a week. I was on a student stipend and, you know, pretty much had money just to pay for my rent and look after myself. But, it was probably, uh, you know, I think life changing for me at, at, you know, at 21 years to be living alone in a place like Germany, having learned the language to a very basic level because I wanted to survive and make friends, um, travel the length and breadth of Germany because that's all I could afford. I couldn't afford to go into the other European countries. Uh, attended the now famous, uh, you know, beer festival, uh, you know, and and I think when I it was the end of a year and the employer that I was working with actually offered me an extension to continue and take up a permanent job. But, you know, my gut and my sixth sense told me that, no, it's too far away from home and it's not a country where I see myself living for the rest of my life and I'd like to go back. Uh, and that's how I came back after a year but I can say that this experience, I think, taught me a few things at 21 that you just don't need to overthink a few things in life. You can just go with the flow. Um, you know, there is always a path that's laid out and, you know, you will find your way and have a great time. So I think this, this kind of put me into a path where it made me realize that, you know, I'm young and I could take risks as I go along. As long as you know my my heart and my soul is in the right place, I'm working with the right people. Uh, I think things do work out for you. So this this was the little Germany story that you know I always live with uh, because I think this set a certain path for me in the future. I'm not someone who studied comms or public relations. When I came back to Bangalore, all I knew was that or my parents had said that you either do a master's or or you take up a job. And I was very clear in my heart, I don't want to study anymore. And I'm just going to take up a job. And the only place I got a job was actually the PR agency in Bangalore, uh, way back in 98. And, and that kick-started a whole career for me again, without me really thinking about, you know, is this really the career I want to have? Where is it going to see me in the next 10 years? All I knew was, oh, it's going to pay for my rent. I have a place of my own in Bangalore. Uh, I have some money to get to TGIF at the end of the month, and I'm going to be living on my own at the age of 22. Um, and, and again, that's how the whole career path started. I think one of the major things that you know I have always focused on is, is to really try and keep my mind very open um, you know, and be very flexible, um, because I believe that that is something that takes you five steps ahead in life. Um, you know, just trying to sit in a box and tell yourself that, no, this is the way I'd like to do something and it's my way or the highway. Um, I've never looked at that as, as an approach. Again, um, after a few years in Bangalore, you know, met my husband, got married. And one fine day, he suddenly came and said that, oh, he's moving to Dubai. 
And again, I'm going to say that there is no glamorous story behind me moving to the UAE. It was purely me following my husband. I had a fantastic job in Bangalore. I landed up in Dubai and I will, all I had to do was start from scratch. Um, it was a very different Dubai at that point. In 2003, there was no tallest building of the world. Uh, the or the, the uh, Dubai ended at the end of Sheikh Zayed Road, for those of you who've traveled there. There were no, uh, you know, media city and internet city had just come up. There were hardly any local PR firms in Dubai at that point. Only the multinationals existed. And again, it was, you know, a uh, destiny that I landed up meeting some old friends from Bangalore who were working in Dubai, who turned around and told me that, oh, you're only you know, 27 years old, you've been working with agencies and building them up from scratch in Bangalore. Why don't you try to do your own thing? Um, you know, and, and that was a time in Dubai when a lot of the Indian companies were moving to the Middle East. And, and there was a network back in India of, you know, ex-companies you'd worked with, bosses who, who were very kind to you. And, and this could be a path, you know, you could just set for yourself. And I still remember... Uh, you know, meeting uh, the the founders of Watermelon, they were running something called Watermelon Advertising, very two young Indian boys. And they had the trade license for a PR company and an events company. We were, and they asked me that, how confident are you about setting up Watermelon PR? And my answer to them was that I can meet you at the end of the year. And if we do well, I promise I'll buy you lunch and uh, give you a check. And if I fail, I promise I'll buy you lunch. So this was the deal that I went with for five years with Watermelon, uh, saying that this is how I'm going to take your license and go. And by the end of the fifth year, we had about 15 employees. We had worked with several Indian brands who had come into the Middle East there were opportunities to go open an office in Saudi, which I never wanted to do. Um, and, and again, I think we were able to carve a niche for the agency as, you know, someone who is local, um, you know, someone who understands the landscape really well and, and can work with local brands, um, South Asian brands who are coming into the Middle East. Very proud to say that the agency still exists, uh, is in its year 21 now. Uh, I don't continue to be an owner, but I have a friend who runs it and has been running it fantastically well uh, ever since I moved to Singapore. I'm gonna go to the next slide, um, you know, which is a little film I'm gonna show to you guys. And I think there's a little lesson that comes out somewhere in the midway. I'm not going to make you see the entire three minutes. I'm going to stop somewhere. Uh, but just definitely observe what happens in this film. I know it uh, isn't playing yet. OK, so you're not able to see the film, right? No through the, okay, because it's gone to YouTube, then I'll probably have to go to YouTube and pull it out. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay, wait. Okay, here, yeah. yeah, second. Uh, 
can't see it uh, the audio is not uh, for me it's not playing oh dear <laughs> can anyone hear it or is it just me i mean no, so only just... video only no audio okay 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 great so then let's wait we'll get to it later let no me worries. continue with what i'm doing <laughs> You're trying to play that uh, a movie scene from this uh, Jackie Chan film. That's right. <laughs> you speaking in English? That's what. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. That's an iconic scene, right? Yes. Now, so I'll go back to my slides and I'll come to the film later. Uh, you know, so again, I think. Clearly, something that I can today reflect on and say that, you know, these are four principles that I've worked on, uh, you know, especially when I work, uh, when I've had to work in markets outside and, you know, find my niche, uh, be able to align with people, uh, you know, across countries, across cultures. I think the first, you know, would really be about polite. And second, I think is patience. Um, you know, and, and that's something that I have learned over the years that, you know, I may be coming from a certain market that works at a certain pace, uh, that has a certain way of doing something, but that just necessarily may not be the way how the other side is, is you know, going to react. And hence, it, it requires me to definitely step up and try to understand the person on the other side, uh, you know, and, and really wait for that person to teach me on, on how something would work in their market. The second is really observe, um, you know, and by, by when I say observe, it's really about whether it is mannerisms, whether it is communication skills, whether it is behaviors, um, you know, what works, what doesn't work. What is polite for me to even do to someone? Is it right for me to even WhatsApp somebody, uh, you know, after a 6 p.m.? Should I be doing it on a weekend? Uh, should I wait for a Monday? Is it something that can really wait? I think that that's been another big one. Third is listen. Um, you know, and this I think is very critical. Um, my husband always jokes that, you know, I, I don't think that I have a great listening power, but I think that's at home. Because at work, I'm always listening. So at home, I refuse to listen and I'm the one who's only talking. Uh, but I think it's so important to be just observant and listening to what someone is saying. Because that sets the tone for you to start engaging. Um, you know, and, and that engagement then becomes extremely, extremely fruitful and something that becomes valuable and leads to a result that you, know, you have really set out for yourself. So again, to be honest, I didn't know this 20, 21, 22 years back. Um, but today when I look at myself and when I see that, yeah, I'm able to work across markets, I've been able to adapt in certain markets and I've been able to you know, find a niche for myself. I think these are four things that I, I have you know, intuitively been following at my side. Uh, which has led to me, you know, being able to have a very agile side. Uh, and that agility has led me into new markets, new opportunities, um, you know, for whether it is for my agency or whether it is, you know, really personally for myself as well. Unfortunately, my videos are not going to work. So I'm just going to keep continuing. I think I do have two with both of them. Uh, yeah, videos. This is another critical thing, which I think has been phenomenal in the last five years, you know, and I think technology can play a very, very key part in breaking communication and cultural barriers. I'll give you a very small example. I think it was pre-COVID when I took a trip to China with a colleague of mine and never in my life had I used WeChat. Uh, and, and the first thing she made me do before we boarded that flight was she made me download WeChat and she taught me how to use the app and told me that without this, there's no way you're going to be able to survive in China. And, you know, that was a first starting point for me because I realized that I don't speak Mandarin, uh, but, you know, with the use of an app like this, I'm able to maneuver myself. 
uh, in a market that is so alien to me. And I'm able to feel very comfortable because this, this something like a WeChat binds the entire country together. I've put a couple of apps here because a lot of these are actually very, very strong communication tools in, in, in you know, APAC and Southeast Asia. If I am to ever communicate with a partner sitting in the Philippines, I will always use Facebook Messenger or Viber because that's where they spend most of their time and that will really give me a much quicker response. If I'm gonna to talk to somebody in Thailand, it will always be through line. So again, I think this has required me to, you know, come out of my comfort zone and try to understand the person I'm trying to engage with on how do I really break that barrier and get through to this person. And, and you know, in my conversations, I'm very clear with them that do you prefer that I communicate with you through these platforms? Is that more convenient and conducive? And, you know, can we continue to chat there? And that has, again, helped in building fantastic relationships and keeping it there for years. I have friends who've been running agencies in Thailand for like 15, 18 years now. Uh, somebody in the Philippines who's been around for like 15 years. And I continue to work with them. Because again, I think we have made effort to, to really try and understand each other. Um, and, and make sure that I don't try to go with set mindsets of, you know, what I do in Singapore, what I, you know, the way I behave here is the way I'm going to go and behave when I enter a new market. And I think there are a lot of recent examples for me, especially with the Indonesia scaling up that we did. Uh, as a country, it's a 90 minute flight, which is Jakarta out of Singapore. Uh, so that's like going to maybe a Chennai, Mumbai, or, a, you know, I mean, Bangalore, Mumbai flight for you guys. But it's a whole different country, behaves very differently, um, it's absolutely chaotic, yet very organized, very, very digitally savvy. I wouldn't find a single English newspaper in that country. People speak Bahasa Indonesia. Now they do communicate in English, but yeah, it is not the number one language for business communication. But we have successfully been able to go in, navigate that market, set up our own office, you know, build our own clientele, and most importantly, build a team and, you know, nurture talent who really can stand up to the standards of a Singaporean firm, which I can tell you is, is extremely, extremely high and can be very difficult sometimes. So I think again, for us, finding talent was the, the, the hardest job in that market, not really about finding work. And we, we have tried to build all kinds of systems and processes there to be able to attract talent who'd want to work with a firm like us. And number two, not feel claustrophobic as well, if I'm as a Singaporean firm, highly systematic and process driven. And also on the other side, you know, being able to break barriers within Singapore and explaining and making sure that we are able to align to a, a country we are entering. And how do we make ourselves more attuned and adaptable to people we want to attract there? So I think this has been, I do have a lot of gray hair, uh, you know, since we started the Indonesia operations. Uh, the only endeavor has been that we need to take it to, you know, profitability. We had a huge COVID come between us. Uh, we couldn't travel. We can't get clients. But last year was the testament and we turned profitable there. We have about eight people in that market. I spend more than 60% of my time in Indonesia now. Personally, I love the place. I have traveled the length and breadth of it. Uh, Bali is probably my least favorite place in Indonesia. But it is a world in itself. Probably a large part of me, who, why I've been able to adapt there is also because it's very similar to India, uh, but less chaotic and a lot more simplistic compared to India because you're just dealing with one language. You're dealing with 25 million people. Uh, so it's, it's a much smaller scale. But again, we have seen a lot of interest from Indian companies uh, and worked with clients who have 
you know, bypass Singapore and wanted to go straight into Indonesia. And that's their first market in Southeast Asia that they come into to expand uh, because they find the country demographically very, very similar to India. So hence, that's again something that, you know, I see as a natural fit that we could go in. We were able to attract work. We were able to attract talent. And we were able to move ourselves in a direction which, you know, again, was was a trade and, you know, kind of Singapore-centric wave that went in. The last part I'm going to talk about is, you know, again, the agency I work in currently and where I'm one of the six owners. Um, I have five Singaporean Chinese partners. Uh, I'm the only different looking, differently brought up. Uh, partner amongst the six of us. Um, we are a 28-year-old agency, uh, so which makes us one of the oldest in Singapore. When I walked in 10 years ago, um, I was very clear with my partners that, you know, you are different, I'm different. I don't know if this is going to work out, but we can try. And what this has led us to today is after 10 years, we have one overseas office outside Singapore, which is in Indonesia. We have opened doors to ourselves. It, you know, we are in a country which is a very small country with 5 million people. There's only that much of work that we can generate within this place. We decided to open doors and not be shy and introvert and, you know, go into a global network, make some friends in other markets, find agencies like us, you know, who sit in markets like Ireland, Sweden, which are also small countries, and generate global work for ourselves um, and, and use this as, you know, a platform where we can give our people opportunities to get global exposure. Now, again, you know, this is something that, you know, we could have just shied away from. We are very happy, content to come back home, be with our families, not to do that extra work. But we realize that as an agency that has come 28 years of its journey, if we need to go another 28 years, we do need to keep evolving and, and we do need to open ourselves, you know, to, to newer opportunities. And at least before I retire, this was something that I wanted to do, to say, let's get into one more market outside Singapore and let's look at ourselves you know, and open doors to a world that lies outside because Singapore has positioned itself as a gateway into Asia. And we are in a great position, you know, to be able to do that in a very, very small way. So some of my closest friends today actually are from the global network. Uh, I meet them three to four times a year for conferences. I look forward to being there. Uh, somebody is German, somebody is American, somebody is Irish. Uh, somebody's Indian, and it takes me back to the same experience which I did right after college when I went to Germany, where I was on an exchange program. I had people from different countries. I made my friends at that stage of my life, and even today I continue to have that as as you know a large part of my life, where you know relationships will always determine my work and will carry me forward in my career and not so much about where I have worked, what I have done and, and you know, what is the brands that I've worked with, who are the clients I've worked with. I, I've never looked at it that way, but more of people that I have worked with and what has that experience led to. So from a talking perspective, that's all I have. I'm gonna try very hard to play the videos, uh, especially the last one, uh, because that was talking more about adaptability. Um, can I try, uh, ma'am? Yes, please. That would be great. Yes. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. And to everyone else, uh, while Indra is, you know, putting the video, please feel free to drop in your questions in the chat window and we will take it after this. It isn't playing, Indra. I think it's always Murphy's Law, man. Yeah. 
When you're at a client pitch, it will never work. Yeah, so otherwise it would. Like this, it'll <laughs> never work. It's all right. No worries. We can send the links later and yeah. it's absolutely fine. And uh, these are all videos which are on YouTube. So very easily anyone can find them. Perfect. Right. So thank you so much, Anu, for that you know global experience that you've had over so many years that's you know left me thinking about how to be with people and you know the kind of enriching experiences that you can get out of that more than talk about the brands you work with and all the bang that comes with usual work life right so <laughs> thank you so much for you know that takeaway for me uh, i'd leave this uh, room open for any questions uh, we have the students from gsc uh, anybody please feel free to switch on your camera you know we're happy to see you all and answer your questions and i would be glad to do that uh, i'm sure or else you can even leave you know a, a question on the chat window we'd be happy to take it from there Right, so we've got one question coming from <laughs> Geeta. Geeta. Yes. Geeta. Anu, have you never come across a point where you felt out of place or culture in midst of your co-directors? Culturally, there are differences in the way we eat, drink, hygiene to many such things. I think it's a great question and I'll, I'll answer it you know, as direct as I can. When I went in for my interview at uh, APRW Singapore in 2017, one of the questions I asked my, one of my partners is, do we need to be friends? And, <laughs> and <laughs> ask. I said, well, I'm 40 years old when I'm, you know, kind of joining you guys. And I don't think and I'm, I'm at a stage of life where I can suddenly become your friend. So can we just be business partners and do you expect me to, you know, celebrate your birthdays and, and go out for wine sessions with you guys? Because I don't think I'm ready to do all that. And I think it was as direct as I could be. And she absolutely loved my answer because she said, that's exactly how we are here. We are business partners. We are not friends. Um, and, and, you know, you come in and do your job and you do what you need to do. And in six to eight months time, we, you know, we are engaged currently and we'll know if we can really get married. And, 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 and that's how we decided that, okay, great. And I can tell you that 10 years now, um, four out of the six are very dear friends of mine and I celebrate their birthdays and I go for wine with them. <laughs> but it was definitely not something that I wanted it to come in, you know, as part of, something that I should be forced to do because I think that's where the friction comes, uh, you know, because culturally we could be very different. I may be someone who doesn't like to go to someone's home. I don't like people coming into my home. Uh, I don't like to, you know, be out in the evenings after work is done and I don't want to be forced by someone that I have to be seen. So I think again, as, as you know, someone I've always been very, very, you know, kind of direct, um, and in a, it's it's silly questions like this that I actually ask in an interview and not, you know, I mean, what do you expect of me and, and what are my KPIs and what deliverables do I bring to the table? But I feel when I, you know, settle things like this, the journey becomes a lot easier for me after that uh, because I've made it very clear that this is how I'm going to operate as a person. Setting I saw, the principle uh, of being uh, honest and transparent right in the beginning Yes. Helps, right? Set a stage. Yes. Okay, so we, have, we have another question from Uma, who's our treasurer. What is the difference between observing and listen in the poll principle? Yeah, I think that's a great question because, you know, observing for me is, you know, typically more about, uh, which I've seen more, you know, happens more when you're in person with someone. Uh, and listening can happen when, you know, you are really speaking to someone uh, and not really seeing the person. 
And again, I'll explain that, you know, when I've traveled into markets like Philippines, Thailand, and done work with partners there, that's where I observe a lot, uh, you know, about how they behave, whether it's with the media, with their clients, with their team, with a, a vendor at the venue. Um, this, again, this sets the culture of how business is done in a certain place. Um, listening for me is really more about trying to understand, uh, trying to learn about a certain landscape, a new market, uh, and, and really trying to tell someone that why don't you educate me first before I tell you what I need from you. Uh, so I think this, these are the two things. When I go to talk to a partner for the first time, I never start off by telling them what I need. I always start off by asking them, how have you been and how are things in your market? And, you know, has anything changed since the last time we spoke? Uh, you know, how has market been for you? And then I move on to, you know, telling them why I have called and what is the brief and all of that. Because I think it's very important to, to, to listen to the other party first um, and see where they are coming from before we decide to yeah. throw things at them. Uh, you know, to say, oh, this is why I've called you and, you know, these are things I need to do. So for me, observe is more about, you know, really seeing actions and listening is more about, uh, you know, absorbing education and learning, uh, you know, on, on what happens in an interaction. Wonderful. We How have yeah. Yeah, another question from Shruti oh uh, from Government Arts College, Trichy. Oh How can someone navigate the tension between cultural relativism and universal human values in global relations? My God, I don't even understand that question, man. <laughs> if I can say it as honestly as I can. <laughs> Those are very big words there. <laughs> but I'll give you a very small example, which happened this morning. Uh, I was on a call with a partner from America. And, uh, you know, it was a very early morning call for me. And they were calling because they wanted to do some work uh, in, in Asia. And it's the first time that they were getting on a call with someone from Singapore. And it was interesting because I would say 80% of the time we spent on that call, we were only talking about, you know, geopolitical issues and why Singapore is an important market for them and why you know they are looking to do or navigate and bring their client into asia through singapore and and how someone like us sitting in this market could add value to them and and we never even got down to discussing the scope the project uh, or you know what we are really ultimately going to execute but there was huge alignment in us just realizing that I realized that I'm sitting in a place where, you know, again, I'm, you know, somewhere in the middle where I'm opening certain doors for this partner into a, in a, into a completely new region. And here's my partner who's calling me, who has absolutely no clue on my market uh, and who wants to learn with me and, and go in and win this work. So it was purely, again, a, you know, a very small example where I realized that, yes, I, I do add value. Uh, you know, into a very large global network as a very small country. Uh, and, you know, there are new doors that can open for someone like us. So, you know, I mean, that's the most simple way that I can answer something like this. Uh, because I don't think I can, I'm not a politician. I'm not an analyst. <laughs> and, and, and I'm a communications person. And for me, it's all about communicating my client. And how do I take you into the right medium and the space? Lovely. We have uh, another question from, again, Government Arts College, Trichy, Ms. Purani. The question is, please share an interesting anecdote about cross-cultural communication in your team. Wow. <laughs> okay, this is very interesting because I can give you a very live example of my team that's based in Singapore and my team that's based in Jakarta. And they are both uh, poles apart uh, in terms of culture, in terms of how they operate and how they, you know, have a working style. And my job really has been, I'm literally a mediator between the two. That's how I see myself, where I'm forever educating my team sitting in Singapore on how people in Indonesia, you know, really work 
and react and and you know how they kind of maneuver their you know their work and for my people sitting in indonesia i'm forever educating them on oh you know but your colleagues sitting in singapore this is how they would like work to be done um uh, and and i can tell you that it's been fascinating because i send my team from singapore almost once a month into jakarta and the only brief i give them is please go and spend as much time as you can with your colleagues please go have as much coffee as you can with them uh and then please go have as many meals as you can but that's the only way you can break that barrier on the table and work together as one team because that's what you're going to ultimately give a client uh is is you know giving them that perfect solution you know of of getting into a new market but someone being in singapore and how do i educate you on what that market is so there are several situations we've had where we've gone on uh, off sites into interior parts of indonesia and the team from singapore has has flown down and we've gone and spent uh two days there and it's been eye opening for the team there because i don't think we would have ever reached those parts of indonesia if we didn't have indonesian colleagues uh and for our indonesian colleagues you know we create opportunities for them to come to singapore and and for them to see that you know you're part of a regional agency you're part of a much larger network and and you know we are creating very different opportunities for you so language is the biggest issue that you know we go through as a challenge because my indonesian colleagues don't speak great english and my singaporean colleagues don't speak bahasa indonesia i speak very sedikit is the word which is very little bahasa which i had learned because i want to hear my clients and understand what are they talking while they're sitting with me <laughs> and are they trying to negotiate my costs which i'm not going to allow uh <laughs> I think language has been uh, the biggest barrier we've had to cross and I have given full confidence to my Indonesian team that even if you have really bad English skills and your English is poor I want you to have full confidence to be able to express yourself um you know even in the in even in broken English if you have to but that's that's the skill I want you to have when you leave APRW that you know you get a much better job in a much better place in indonesia it could be a multinational who decides to pick you up because you have increased your communication skills so that's my only kpi to my team that your communication skills should have improved uh and we've had hilarious scenarios uh on these trips where we've tried to communicate with each other and but i think there's a little bit of an advantage a lot of people in singapore do speak bahasa indonesia they speak bahasa malay um so they're slightly better off than me though they never show that um uh, but you know it is a different world for any singaporean who goes to indonesia because they are just so used to everything being perfect <laughs> interesting <laughs> thank you thank you so much for that anu and for patiently answering all the questions thank you guys for the questions i will Hand it over to Uma, who's the treasurer of. Suran, there's one more question, yeah, from from somebody. Oh, sorry. Sorry, one last question for you, Anu, uh, which is from Ranjit from GAC Trichy. How can organizations promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in their global communication efforts? And what role can communication professionals play in driving this effort? Equality. Not equal. <laughs> Yes and, yeah, and to be yeah. honest you know i think i'm such a wrong person to answer this because the agency i work in there are six women owners i don't think it's i i'm not very proud of that to be honest uh i think uh we've reached a point where no man wants to sit with us on the table now okay uh we are 50 people in the agency we have only five men and we have 45 women So I'm like no guys I don't think we are anywhere close to doing the DE and I or whatever you call it but unfortunately you know our industry which is communications is is highly gender you know kind of biased and this is something we've seen globally 
uh, yeah. you know, and it may be because, I don't know, we are better multitaskers. I don't know. We, we kind of choose this career because it works well for us from a long-term perspective. We are able to balance a lot of things uh, as we go along. But unfortunately, I have, in my 27 years, never seen any kind of gender equality for sure in any markets that I have worked. So I'm not going to lie about it. Uh, but in Indonesia, I've managed to build that diversity. Uh, oh. I have more men in my team than women. Uh, and again, I think it could be a situation of the market. Uh, it could be uh, that more people are taking on those kind of jobs and they have the flair to do it. Um, so again, it's not something that I made an effort towards, but it happened. Um, so I think again, organizations, this is a very location and geography centric uh, issue. Some countries which are very developed have policies, have you know uh, everything laid out for DE and I. Uh, while countries like us or developing nations, I don't think we are there as yet. Uh, to really put this as, you know, mandatory for people to follow. It's just, you know, what businesses need to take as decisions that work for them, you know, as, on the go. And and they just have to navigate it, you know, as per challenges that they are facing. That's how I've seen it. How was the scenario in Dubai? Oh, that was many years ago. And I'm sure Dubai has changed. But again, in the early 20, I mean, 2000s, when I started the agency, it was more women than men. Uh, maybe the studio had more men, uh, but on the servicing and client servicing side and all of that were, were more women. Um, it was never men. Uh, so again, I think it, it took me, you know, I haven't seen that scenario change anywhere except in Indonesia. Uh, uh, Suraj, I have a question. Anu, hi. Anbu. Yeah. Uh, how much do you think the internet has played a role in uh, kind of, uh, you know, breaking down this uh, cultural barriers and bringing people closer together? Because I'm sure those days, of course, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have access to information. Uh, right now, you could just Google up and figure out, uh, you know, uh, uh, language translations or what people like food in different countries or whatever or things to do, not to do, etc. Or, or always there at, your, at the click of a mouse. So how much do you think has the internet uh, paved a way for this cultural barriers to kind of uh, break and people coming together? No, I think it's great. It's a great question. And, you know, I face this a lot, especially when I, you know, go from a country like Singapore and I travel overseas, uh, you know, especially to the U.S. and stuff. Uh, um, so I think there are there's a good and bad to this, Anbu. The okay. good is that definitely people have access to information very easily now, sitting anywhere. People can Google, watch videos on YouTube. They learn so much more about a country. But the second part, which is the bad part to it, is that you know it does lead to certain perceived perceptions of a certain place, which may not okay. always be true. I can tell you that when I started getting involved with the network like IPREX, the first thing I had to tell people is, you know, I'm crazy, I'm Asian, but I'm not rich. Because all they associated with me was crazy rich Asians. <laughs> and the movie. Because I came from Singapore. And okay. it's taken me two years to break that barrier to make people realize there's so much more to Singapore than just that movie or a Marina Bay Sands that you see on YouTube. Um, you know, that, but yes, my government does a great job in putting us digitally out there. And we spend a lot of money, which has led to the awareness. But everything you see is not what it's really all about. Okay. Uh, you know, so I think, again, the internet is great to get a certain level of awareness. But I would say anything beyond that has to be, uh, you know, the effort that you take to learn about that place. Um, you know, and engage with someone you may know, someone who's lived there, someone who's had an experience to go on work trips there, holidays there. I think that's a starting point for me. Okay. Thank you. I think our president will book our flights to Singapore. 
quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. Now he has a friend. <laughs> I promise to take you out for a lovely meal. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anu. No, thank you, everyone. So, oh, to you, Uma. Uh, so, Umanath is the treasurer of the Advertising Club of Madras, Anu, and also the managing editor of Media News for You. Thank you, Suraj. So, uh, um, <clears throat> as an editor uh, in India, when you talk about DI in uh, DEI in um, Carcom world, uh, I receive around uh, seven calls from uh, female professionals, uh, executives, uh, out of ten. So, and uh, even in events, I also come across equal number. So. At least in the comms uh, arena, uh, women are uh, well placed, um, and uh, in India too, it is uh, uh, the scenarios like that. So that's my observation. I'd like to add, and uh, uh, I know uh, it was a, a a life session. What I can say because when you started off with uh, your uh, German student exchange program. Fine, okay. She's talking about something personal. And then when you said your hubby suddenly got transferred to Dubai, okay, she's on an intro mode. Yes, when will she come to the topic? Then further, <laughs> it went on to say that suddenly I was wondering, um, someone has to tell her to come to the topic. She goes on talking something about her personal life. <laughs> then suddenly I realized that, no, it's about how she herself broke the barriers in each and every market where she traveled. And I said, this is uh, another wonderful session <laughs> where we haven't witnessed uh, anything like this in the past. So it is unique on its own. So you spoke about the whole principle or uh, setting up watermelon in uh, Dubai and Middle East, and then um, to the pole principle, then uh, it's, uh, how the technology breaks the culture barrier. Be a Roman in Rome, download WeChat when you are in uh, China. So, <laughs> and uh, then uh, you, all, all the way to Singapore, how you, you have uh, bro broken the barrier, Singapore market, Indonesia, and uh, partnering with uh, Mandarins, offering PR service across Southeast Asian market. And uh, again, another... Uh, cultural barrier breaking initiative and finally anu the global citizen who stands as an example of uh, breaking the culture barrier uh, throughout his life and determined to break many more so uh, let's hope you will travel across europe and uh, <laughs> the leftover markets across <laughs> so, no no i'm tired of of coloring my hair now so no more <laughs> Sounds when you are talking so proud about Singapore and its market, sitting at the center in Singapore and venturing around the markets around. So that's a nice, good idea. See, like uh, um, offering services, PR services, or com, com service across the smaller markets wherever it is needed. All these are need based markets. So many Southeast Asian markets where there is a dearth for professionals. So going, setting up team. Creating a team, creating a culture, all that is a great um, initiative that you are doing. Thank you so much for uh, putting your life itself as an example for this whole session. We always uh, feel proud that uh, you are the second uh, uh, expert from the field of uh, PR or comms, corporate communication. And uh, the earlier one was something related to the basics of uh, PR and uh, uh, within India, and you just took it to uh, the international level and uh, with a uh, onset of uh, how to break the barriers, cultural barriers. Thank you so much, Anu, and uh, it was one session. And uh, looking forward to engaging you in another uh, session related to the Madras Advertising Club. Yeah. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Star Vijay, the associate sponsor and uh, social media partner deep sense and media partner myself media news for you.com and uh, the creative partner presto and the whole team uh, indra uh, uh, vaishnavi and uh, lokesh from the ad club secretariat for uh, 
the coordination. Uh, thank you all for your patience and hope you all had wonderful takeaway today. The field of PR is largely unexplored when it comes to South because many don't know the importance of it. So uh, I'm really happy that this session would have uh, been an eye opener and uh, even for many people from the uh, students uh, community to explore uh, PR as a career because uh, the southern region doesn't have lot many people choosing this. So lot many people fly down from Mumbai to Chennai to all small towns to conduct events uh, because that, that clearly shows that there is a dark and people are not choosing it in it's a lot of plenty of scopes are there. So you also can consider that as a career opportunity. It is, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, corporate communication. It's a it's an allied side of advertising, media, marketing. So you all please think about it. Thank you so much. Looking forward to engaging you. Another uh, wonderful Thank you. in the Inside View series in another fortnight's time. Thank you. Thank so you so much, Arav. Thank you, Anu. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening and enjoy your weekend. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.